So some of you may be stuck in the differences that have happened this morning than what you're used to on a typical Sunday morning, which is perfect fodder for the talk. Inquiring minds want to flow because we didn't ring the bell and we didn't do three ohms. And in fact, we didn't even do a meditation. <laughs> oh, well, it's just perfect because that's the flow that happened this morning. Marcus Aurelius, we often hear just a little bit of his quote and quite honestly misquoted when we hear no one can step into a river, the same river twice. That's not actually what he said. What he actually said is this, no man ever steps into the same river twice for it is not the same river and he is not the same man. That's a little different than we can't. It's just a fact. We don't. Now let me read that so that it is more inclusive. No one ever steps into the same river twice. For it is not the same river and we are not the same person. And then if you really want to let it in, I never step into the same river twice. For it is not the same river and I am not the same person. I invite you to consider when you find quotes that move you, personalize them. Read them in the first person. Let that sink in because it will in a very different way. So this morning, inquiring minds want to flow. Why is it not the same river? Because it's constantly moving. Why are you not the same person? Because you are constantly changing. Creation is just that. It is creation. It is never stagnant. If creation were stagnant for a moment, everything that we have ever experienced would cease. Gone. Everything. I think it was Einstein that during an interview, somebody asked him what was one thing he knew for sure. And he said that everything is always in motion. Everything. And so this idea of locking in to one thing is perhaps the most insane thing that we do as humanity. I did a talk last week for Unity in San Jose virtually. And the talk title that came to me was Curiosity is a portal to the limitless life. And then they asked me to give a little blurb about that. And I was coming up empty. I was like, that's a great talk title. What the heck does it mean? <laughs> and so I went in to contemplation about it. And this is what came. The slippery slope of certainty is perhaps our greatest limitation. Fixing our thought in the rightness of a factual past. Each time we dare to imagine an indefinable newness, we move into an expanded experience of our own infinite divinity. That is curiosity. Will we allow ourselves to do that? Last week, we ended the talk with you are, I am, we are the infinite's curiosity in form. And yet, I have experienced over the years that we really resist curiosity. We resist asking questions of ourselves and one another. And for some reason, that's not true. 
I do know why we're. <laughs> the reason is because we've been taught that if someone questions us, to be offended. If you're asking me a question about me or something I believe, you're challenging me. You're underneath that. What you're really saying that you won't say is that I'm wrong. And you're right. And so when we're asked a question, our default human response tends to be defensiveness because we're perceiving the question as an attack. What could be more ridiculous in an infinite creation that is always moving? Always moving. I quoted... Revelations last week because I love bringing the Bible into metaphysics. <laughs> it's an amazing library of books. And if we just change our seat in the stadium of how we look at it, we might actually learn some things. <laughs> Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. If that's not questioning, what is? There's always a knock at the door. Open the door. Open to the curiosity. How many times a day do you question something? Right? The problem isn't that we don't question. The problem is that we don't freaking answer them. Right? When you see something and something inside of you says, what's that about? Answer the question. When you're in the middle of something and you question, what am I doing? Answer the question. If you want to know what is operating in your consciousness? Answer the question. That symbol up there, for those of you online, I'm pointing to the science of mind teaching symbol. The circle with the three sections and what appears to be a V in it. We talk a lot about those three sections. We don't talk enough about that little foot in the middle. Because what he's really, that came about... When Ernest Holmes was teaching a class and he said, let's assume that this is everything, right? And he made a circle just for context because everything can't have a circle, <laughs> has no edges, right? And he divided up the sections, not as separate things, but as attributes of the creative process, right? That mind is activated into law and then it produces form or experience that's this downward slope the upward one that I rarely hear us talk about is really I think the most important one in the mix because what he's indicating there is then we observe what is in form and we have another thought and that thought instantly is acted upon. And so what he's really demonstrating is the cycle. And that's why we wind up with these beliefs that are so deeply held. We just believe them. And if somebody were to ask you, when did you learn to believe that? We look like a deer in the headlights because we don't know. We don't know when we began to believe that because we were born into those beliefs and nobody even sat us down and taught us. It's just how it has been because it's in the collective consciousness. If we would begin to own that second part, we would begin to really establish and take power in controlling what's in the collective consciousness, in healing what's in the collective consciousness. See, when we observe stuff, when we observe people, when we observe our own out of alignment, 
perhaps if we simply ask what's true and thought that, that is acted upon by law and that manifests. If we will stop asking what's wrong and start asking what's right. If we'll stop asking what's missing and start asking what's available. All we have to do is change our seat in the stadium of life. Look at it from a different perspective. Own the power that we have. Every one of us, as Rumi said, we are not, the the drop is not the whole ocean, but the whole ocean is in every drop. You are not all of creation, but all of creation is in you. That's how much power we have. That's how much clarity is available to us if we will answer the questions that come up for us. Because those questions that just come, perhaps... That is the divine standing at the door and knocking. Perhaps that is the invitation to open to something greater than you have been able to conceive of. I look around the room here in our sanctuary, as I often do, and I see these beautiful banners, joyfully creating beloved community. Am I? There's a question to ask. Am I? What does beloved community look like? There's a question. I'm going to save that one for last. (laughs) Celebrating our oneness in spirit. What does that look like? Do I even understand what that means? Those are questions to sit with. My favorite which was such a bold move organizationally by Centers for Spiritual Living to establish a vision of a world that works for all. What does that mean? Do we know? No, we don't. We absolutely, if we are being really honest, we don't have a clue what that means. Most of us don't even understand the word world. Are we talking about my world, your world? Because there's, you know, if you, we all live in our own little world, right? And some people will tell you we already have a world that works for all because we each live in our own little world. All right. I, okay. Is that what that means? Maybe. I don't know. I don't think so. But that's just what I think. Are we talking about the world as a earth sphere? Right? What are we really talking about? What does it mean that works? (laughs) That's such a slippery slope, right? A world that works. Well, what works for me may not work for you. Some people hear works as everybody's employed. Hey, a world that everyone is employed for all. I've heard it translated that way. Hey. I've heard people say the world already works for all because consciousness spiritual principle works the same for everybody all the time. That's true. But is that what that means? I don't know. And I'm bold enough and vulnerable enough to own. I don't know. And so if I don't even really know what that means, how will I know what it looks like? How will I know how to get there? We have to start asking different questions. We have to be brave enough to own 
three of the most magical words I've ever heard strung together. I don't know. I don't know. And feel what you feel. <laughs> really let yourself feel that. I don't know. There's an amazing book written by a gentleman, D.E. Polk. I don't know the way of knowing. <laughs> because if I won't admit I don't know, the door is closed. The music's up loud. I don't hear any knocking. Because <laughs> I'm just jamming out to my own beliefs. It's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's just a thing. In the truth of oneness, and I'm going to wrap up with this. If I close the door for myself, I close the door for you. Every place I limit me, I limit you. Because there's only one. What it's going to take for humanity to truly heal is for all of us to open our minds. For all of us to open our hearts. For us to be willing to sit with people that hold excruciatingly divergent beliefs and be curious. Not listening to correct. That is not curiosity. That is a setup. It's mental violence. Stop it. But to listen. Because perhaps when we begin a spiritual practice of authentically, genuinely listening to one another instead of listening to make each other wrong or listening to grow our posse of rightness. Perhaps then we will begin to experience wholeness and oneness and the diverse magnificence that is available in one mind. Jared made a comment earlier. If your God isn't big enough to include all versions. And so I will say this. If your mind isn't big enough to include all the thoughts in mind, that's your brain. It's not your mind. Your mind already has all those thoughts. They're already yours. The only thing that is creating your pain is your resistance to owning what is in mind. As Ernest Holmes said, and I'm going to close with this, there is no such thing as your mind and my mind. There is just mind. Let's take this into prayer. As I breathe into the truth of oneness, the reality of one thing, one life, one breath, one heartbeat, one mind, one body, everywhere present, creating, <laughs> individualizing itself in exquisite multiplicity, individualized. I know that I am that. And I know that Every expression of life is that. From the tiniest to the most majestic. All fully infused with this one. All diverse. All equal. All included in the body of the infinite. 
And so I know that that being the truth, that being the singular reality of creation, that what is available to me is to question every barrier I have built against experiencing that. To question, to resolve, to bring into alignment every lie that operates in the collective consciousness of humanity. And then as I say yes to asking the right questions, as I say yes to responding to every question divinity brings to my attention, every time there's a knock, I open the door and I answer the question. I get that much closer to my true self, the true shared self. And as I get that much closer to me, I get that much closer to all in the one body. And as I know the truth of that, inclusion becomes the only available practice. So grateful, so grateful to feel that vibrate in every cell of my being, that inclusion is the only option. And so I celebrate. I celebrate that the word spoken is the word fulfilled. And I let go of being distracted by time frames in this human realm. And I simply stand on the authority, on the agency of that which created me and lives within me, that it is done. It is done. It is done. And I invite you to join me as we say together, and so it is.